Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, where we are taking a look at what appears to be a Japanese Type 14 Nambu pistol, but it's not quite. This is actually a Japanese North China Type 19 pistol, and it is a combination of two different things, both an improvement on the Type 14 design, and also kind of desperation production in North China late in World War II. So the issue here was that, of course, the Japanese military had a large number of troops stationed in China, what they called the China Expeditionary Force. And by 1944, U.S. activity in the Pacific theater was had pretty much completely cut off Japanese shipping ties to mainland China. So these troops that were engaged, deployed, stationed in China didn't have the logistical support from mainland Japan anymore that they really needed. Now, the Japanese had for a long time been, uh, I don't know if dependent is the right word, but they had been exploiting the possibility of using Chinese industry and, and workers and factories and everything to, to produce war material. So there was ar Japanese arms production located in China, particularly in Manchuria. Um, we see this with uh, what they called the Mukden arsenal, which was producing rifles, machine guns, a bunch of stuff. Well, by 1944, they, the troops in China decided that they needed more firearms, more pistols in particular, I guess, and uh, they set up a program to run, to basically reorganize a new arsenal system in China. It was going to be run by the Nanking arsenal, and uh, then have some subsidiary shops and, and secondary arsenals actually doing production. And the, the gun, one of the guns that they set up for production was this, the Type 19. Now, a little bit of an aside about nomenclature. Uh, there, there are generally two standards for Japanese uh, designations in this period. One of them is the, the year of the Taisho era uh, of emperors, and the second is the Japanese calendar year. So, for example, the Type 99 is based on a calendar year, 2599 where the Type 38 is based on the year of the Taisho dynasty. Well, Type 19 doesn't fit either of these. It is non-standard, and it's actually the year of the Showa dynasty. The Showa era began in 1925. Add 19 years to that, you get 1944, and that's where the name of this comes from. So, uh, the initial plan apparently was to make about 5,000 of these pistols. Uh, one of the arsenals was going to do about 3,000, the other arsenal was going to do about 2,000 of them. In reality, they appear to have made about 200, maybe 250 of them total. But what's interesting is there are two different versions of these guns, and despite this being really minuscule production, kind of last ditch, what can we manage to produce here now that we're cut off, despite that, there are a couple of really substantial and good improvements that they made to the design. So let me show you that. So the first of those improvements is the safety, which is a massive improvement. This is the fire position, that is the safe position. This is actually a safety that's reasonably accessible from a firing grip, unlike the original Type 14 Nambu safety, which is this 180 degree throw lever right up here on the side of the frame. Ignore the fact that I've taken the back off. This thing is really an awful safety lever. This is much better. Then the second major improvement is this lever. This is a disassembly lever, which does not exist on the standard Type 14. On the Type 14, in order to disassemble it, part of the process is actually removing the trigger guard. So I've removed. So disassembling the Type 14 is really a kind of awkward three-handed affair. Uh, you have to push in the magazine release. You have to push in the slide. You have to have it, you know, the recoil travel taken up like that. And then you have to pull the trigger guard assembly down. This is actually a separate component. So if we do this, push against the table, and then come on. There we go. All right, now you can see the trigger has slid down a bit. Now I can pull off the slide assembly. It's a little bit easier to do this if you take the grips off first, but you get the idea. They have this as a separate assembly that comes completely off the frame. This disassembly lever is indicative of a much simpler method on the Type 19. So I still have to take the rear of the cocking piece off first, 
but that's not a big deal. So here we go, there's that. The firing pin spring. Then all I have to do is push this in, pull the lever down, and presto, the slide comes off and the locking block falls out. The slide here on both of these, this is the 14, this is the 19, uh, their travel under recoil is limited by this section right here, this little uh, cutout recess. And there's a block that comes up in the frame that engages in that, and so that, that determines how far back, uh, back and forward the slide can go. On the Type 14 that block is right here, and it's part of the trigger guard. That's why the trigger guard has to come out in order to remove the slide. What the engineers did with the 19 was make that block a rotating piece. So your disassembly lever here just takes that uh, that locking that, that block and rotate it down and out of the way, thus allowing the slide to come off. It's really a very clever improvement. Mechanically, the rest of the Type 19 is basically the same. So we have this little pivoting locking block that locks the bolt on the inside to the slide on the outside. So this all goes backward under recoil slightly. This hits a protrusion in the frame, at which point it pivots down, which unlocks the bolt, allows the bolt to travel backwards. We can take that off. We can then pull out the bolt itself. It has two recoil springs, one on either side, just like the Type 14. There we go. We have our firing pin inside there. Again, all of this is mechanically identical to the Type 14. Now let's take a look at the markings on here. They're, like I said, they're two different styles, and they're both, they're, well, they're marked with different fonts, but they both have basically the same markings. This is uh, North China 19 type, so this is the model designation. This is our serial number, 76 with a leading zero, and then this character at the very beginning is two horizontal lines in a circle, and that is the numeral 2. And that indicates that this is a second quality gun, which is to say a crummy quality gun, to be just frank about it. Um, the two patterns of these that are found are mechanically basically the same, but the first type is actually very well made, very well finished, and has a uh, like a bullseye logo right down in here as a final inspection proof mark. Then there is this type, there are a batch of these, where the machining is extremely crude. And we'll take a look at that in just a minute, but you can already see it. I mean, just this curve right here looks like it was kind of done by an angry beaver with an angle grinder. Uh, and there's about, there are about the same number of these two types, both known. So um, the, the serial numbers for these are reported between 4 and, or 004 and 093. Uh, the serial numbers for the first pattern, the, the better quality guns, are reported between 4 and 55. Exactly what these differences are is really not clear. Whether they were two different factories, um, one, one with good production and one with poor quality production, or some other in, uh, explanation entirely, I just don't know. Really the only other major uh, differentiation that you can visibly see between first and second quality guns, aside from the quality itself, are the type of grips. Uh, the second quality guns have these grips with uh, a smooth border to them, and very very light, very shallow uh, gri uh, gripping grooves. The first quality ones, the good ones, have much deeper grooves and they go all the way from side to side. So they look much more like standard Type 14 grips. You can see the poor quality of the machining pretty well on a lot of the internals. So the ejector right there is pretty crude. Um, you know, things like this, places that are just glaringly asymmetrical. We have some really rough uh, cuts right in here. The rear sight is rather crudely cut. It's not quite on center there. A lot of it evident in the, the curved cuts. Uh, here around the trigger guard. A lot of these look like they were done by hand. One other characteristic of these guns, which was used elsewhere in the Japanese arsenal system as well, is that they're actually matched by assembly number. So the serial number is only on the frame on the outside. All of the internal parts are numbered separately. So we have 104, 104, this one is assembly number 104. We have it on the guide rod there, we have it on the bolt, 104, 
it's on the front of the grip right there, and even on the firing pin there, if you can make it out, 104. So the rationale for this assembly number thing is that you don't necessarily know when you start production that every one of those parts and guns that you're making is going to end up being a finished and accepted gun. So what you do is wait to serialize the guns until they've passed all the proof marks, all the proof tests. Then you stamp on a serial number and it goes into military inventory, and any guns that don't pass can be recycled through the program, or have parts changed, or whatever it takes, or just scrapped, without uh, leaving holes in the serial number uh, line. Instead, when you're assembling the guns, you mark them all with an interim number, in this case 104, so that you can keep all the parts for an individual gun together during the manufacturing process, and then the bluing process, and any fitting processes that are involved. Now, this doesn't make any sense if you're only doing 100 guns and you have a three-digit assembly number. Like, you might as well really have just used a serial number on that. Um, but they did anticipate, they planned on doing a much, much higher production of these pistols than they ended up actually getting to. There are less than two dozen of these pistols known to exist. I think it's actually 18 total, and that's including both variations. They are extremely rare guns. Only a very small number were manufactured, and most of those ended up lost in China. So they may still exist in China. Um, the firearms collecting community, the international firearms collecting community, doesn't really have very good communication or ties to China. So it's really kind of impossible to say what may or may not still be in existence and recognized over there. But uh, here in Europe and the United States, very, very few of these surviving. So it was very cool to get a chance to take a look at this one. Uh, if I ever have the opportunity to come across a first pattern one, one of the really nicely made ones, I'll definitely uh, do a video on that for you guys as well. If uh, you have a collection of Japanese handguns and you would like to add this one to it, it is of course coming up for sale here at Rock Island. So if you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to ForgottenWeapons.com. Click on that, and you can then uh, click a second link from Forgotten Weapons to head over to Rock Island's catalog page and take a look at their pictures, their description, their price estimate, all that good stuff on this guy. Thanks for watching.